and they said that Simeon blessed God. All right, today we have an incredible guest, someone that I've had the privilege of getting to know recently, the founder of Apologia Center, YouTuber, missionary, extraordinaire. This man does it all. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we have Arthur. How do you say your last name? Asadurian. All right. So um, you just got back from Armenia. Correct. Tell me a little bit about that and the work you're doing over there. Uh, so uh, we moved to Armenia, my family and I, for a year and a half okay. until 2020. Uh, September 7th, 2020, we got back. Okay. Uh, so we're there February 2019 to that. So 16 months. Um, and we went there specifically with the purpose and reason of starting an apologetics ministry. Okay. Apologetics ministries don't exist in Armenia. I know it's weird. It's an Armenian it's na uh, uh, Christian nation. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's one guy I came across that has passed away since uh, um, uh, he started this stuff. Uh, but he, he did apologetics. He had like a website, mm -hmm. but outdated older gentleman written on it. But it never really took off. Uh, but yeah. So we went there to start an apologetics ministry. This was my first time going back since uh, coming here, obviously, because of the pandemic, there's a war in Armenia. Mm -hmm. It's uh, in a weird state right now. And so, um, yeah, we went there, we spent a month there. We did a um, day and a half, two day conference. And then we spent a week with uh, some college students, high school and college students mm -hmm. with a campus ministry ministering to them. So pretty cool, man. We had about 70 something people show up to our conference, mm -hmm. about 70 something at that. So and you go you go every year to Armenia to do this show. The goal is to go every year. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. Um, so let's get into uh, the, you know we, I want to touch on apologetics and the need for apologetics in today's climate with a lot of folks who are deconstructing. Most notably, a couple years ago, uh, Joshua Harris, mm -hmm. I kiss dating goodbye. Uh, there's been folks like uh, Gunger from the mm -hmm. band, the worship band, Gunger, uh, I think, Mar uh, is his name Michael Gunger? Yeah, Michael Gunger. Uh, I believe Amy Grant, uh, all kinds of folks that are Christian celebrities. Fanatic. Fanatic from the cross movement. I was trying not to uh, to say <laughs> Fanatic's name. Shout out, shout out to Fanatic. Yeah. Um, so there's this, there's this tension that I think people feel to kind of want to take it personal, right? And so... I want you to talk about like what is your reaction to when people publicly de deconvert, and should Christians be taking it personal? Like, is this something? Like, how should we feel about this? Well, look, um, I mentioned Fanatic. Uh, it was probably my favorite rapper. From okay. Across, well, okay. That's that's why I mentioned. Okay. That. Respect. I think like as an as an artist, the, the guy's brilliant. Yeah. Um, but I mean, take it personal because we we build connections with musicians, especially. You mm -hmm. know, we listen to their music quite a bit, mm -hmm. and so because of the connections we we make. We take it personally. Mm. How should we feel about it? Look, it's sad. It should break our hearts mm. because we want everyone to follow Jesus and, and, and know Jesus better. Especially if they're people that we look up to, mm -hmm. it's going to impact us. Right. Uh, so the emotions are going to be there. I think to be kind of uh, stoic about it and just kind of ignore it and stuff mm -hmm. like that um, is probably not a healthy yeah. thing to do. It's normal to, <laughs> to feel a way. Correct, yeah. yeah. It, it, it would be like... Uh, the equivalent of someone divorcing the faith almost someone like 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 a, a person of your family that's extended divorcing yeah. someone that you care about is, yeah, that, would, is that a fair I'll, metaphor yeah. it's interesting so when i hear a lot of these folks talk about why they deconvert the common themes not always but a lot of times is like is it there's a political overtone hmm. because there's the affiliation of christianity in the west is evangelicals and evangelicals are maga and MAGA doesn't like anything related to any social causes, anything related to anything like that. So MAGA, bad, uh, and therefore Christianity, bad. I'm oversimplifying. Yeah. Right? I'm oversimplifying. But it does seem like they throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Uh, would you say that's a fair assessment? I would say so, yeah. Um, I think there's a number of other things that come come into it. Uh, some of these people have been thinking about these things for for some time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the MAGA phenomenon is fairly recent, yep. right? Yep. Um, so some of these people, it seems like, have been thinking about it, had issues mm -hmm. when they were doing whatever it was that was doing, yep. if they're generally musicians, then, yeah. that, you know. Um, and then now we've kind of seen the climax of that. Yep. Yeah, I think, I, think you're, I think you're spot on. And I think what happens is um, 
from my experience is like you said, people are thinking about it. They're wrestling with it. And I don't always think like, I don't think it's always like, I want to be lukewarm and like be in sin. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the motivation. I think it's, it's more of a philosophical, cultural thing that starts in, in your head. But I grew up in Armenian Apostolic Church. You're Armenian. Did you, you did you go to Armenian Apostolic Church? As a I kid? did. Yeah. Did. Not, not, I was uh, Easter and Christmas and maybe some weddings. And funerals okay. Christian. Yeah. So like I was like an altar boy. Yeah. I think I got to find a picture of me as. So a, as you as, were a lot more committed. Than yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, because that's as a refugee, that's all we had. Like we came here, and that became the crux and the center of our community. Uh, in San Diego, St. John got a bad church. They since relocated to the Del Mar area, and uh, it. My initial impression of Christianity as a seven, six, seven year old kid was a bunch of folks that were darker skinned than me, yeah. who served this Jesus <laughs> that was darker skinned than me, right? And had a very ethnic connection and a lot of ethnic pride around their Christianity. Right. Yeah. We're the first Christian nation. Right. Right. We're the very first. We, you know, and it was, it was, it was really interesting to 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 see that. And then it was also really interesting to have that connected to the Armenian genocide. And then like you find that out as a kid and you're like, wait, 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 what happened? How many people that? And like, it's because we're Christians, right? Like, and it was like, wow, this is, this is so fascinating. And then my second encounter with the gospel was folks from the Black Baptist tradition, mm. right? So my very first two interactions, before I even knew what a white evangelical was, before I even knew what, the, what a non-denominational church was, it was the Armenian apostolic church, a bunch of folks that look more like you than me, right? And then it was a bunch of folks that were black that came from the black Baptist tradition, mm -hmm. which is, they could, I think they couldn't be a part of the Southern Baptist coalition because of, uh, uh, you know, racism and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So they started their own denomination, Baptist. And uh, those were my first two interactions. So I almost feel like I have an advantage in that when people were deconstructing and the reasons they were giving was because of cultural, because of white supremacy, because it's the West, because all these different things, I'm sitting here thinking like, well, that was just not my in interactions and encounters with Christians, right? And I think the beautiful part, and this is where I really want you to kind of get t tell us more about this, is... I think one of the best ways to, to, to avoid deconversion and deconstruction is to travel and expose yourself to more huh. Christians. Yeah, that'd be nice. Right? And to see that. And any, any Christ, Christian friends that I have, black Christian friends that I have that go to Ethiopia uh, or go to Israel, go to Jerusalem, always come back reinvigorated in their faith, right? Because they see how much bigger Christianity is. But I think that, and I want you to talk about that, and then also church history. Yeah. Right. So, which one do you want to tackle first for us? The, yeah. the, 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 look, the broader I, side. Ex experience is very important here, so yeah. I can, we can start there. Mm -hmm. I was born in Etchmiadzin, okay, which is the holy see of the Armenian Apostolic Church. Okay. The main church, right, um, of where the Catholicos is, that is in my hometown. Mm -hmm. So, and they have a seminary there. So, I, I even as a young kid, even though I didn't go to church, especially when we moved to the states, but um, I always saw essentially priests and training it's it's kind of the town is surrounded by it. it's known for that mm -hmm. um and so it's it's a completely different sort of it's the, all i knew i didn't i didn't know white christianity i mean white christianity was a foreign thing to mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. it's because armenian christianity was home and it, it was what was what was dear to my heart and yeah. all that um and so those experiences are very important because um we realize or we should realize at one point or another in our lives that this isn't the only expression of Christianity in the world. Yeah. And so how do I deal with that? Right? Uh, so for me, it, it was... Uh, some people, it's like white evangelicalism, and then they meet, you know, like a Greek Orthodox guy, and they're mm -hmm. like freaked out. Like, these, <laughs> you know, what are these guys doing? Now, right. Why do they dress like that or something like that? Right. For me, it was the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's like when I saw churches where people didn't have all the garb it wasn't the yeah, yeah, yeah it was a culture shock stuff. i was like yeah this is not christianity yeah, what is yeah, this yeah, it looks yeah. silly yeah uh so I, I remember going to a harvest crusade like my first experience uh basically with uh evangelicals mm -hmm. went to harvest crusade greg lori mm -hmm. with some friends i had that i made at the school and i remember everybody was worshiping people were on their knees worshiping and stuff and i i remember standing there and saying i think they're a cult <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, these people are nuts. What yeah. are they doing? Like, yeah. why are they on their knees? Like, yeah. you know, I was just in shock. Because I didn't really know what I was going to. It was like, hey, there's this Christian kind of thing going on. I was like, sure. Mm -hmm. But I'd never experienced anything like that. Yeah. 
And so that was a shock for me. And it's very important for us to know how to, how to navigate that. Church history will give us the framework mm-hmm. of how to look at this because um, it, it crosses denominational lines. Mm-hmm. It crosses historical lines, mm-hmm. time-wise, time, you know, third century versus 15th century versus mm-hmm. now. Um, and then cultural lines. Mm-hmm. So you get Germans and Middle Easterners and North Africans and Americans. Like that's, th- they all have different expressions. When you see that and you understand that well, I think it kind of calms you down mm. not to overreact against your own experiences. Mm-hmm. Do you think that if people had more understanding of church history, mm. that it could anchor them against going down the slippery slope of deconstruction and then oftentimes deconversion. Absolutely. No okay. question about it in my mind. Okay. So, because how I think about it is, I've heard, you know, like the Andy Stanleys and um, uh, Lee Strobel's, Josh McDowell's, and they're like, man, like the resurrection, right? Like we look mm-hmm. at the validity of the Bible through the event of the resurrection, and and then we look at ch- church history being split. I mean, a history being split, and then the resurrection is like that's the crux. That's like a, right. a classical apologetics, if you will, right? But I always, I've never heard anybody describe, and maybe this is a book or, or some sort of <laughs> idea, but, I, but I've never heard anybody go the other side of like the resurrection, and then it wasn't like hundreds and hundreds of years, and then we got the Bible, and then thousands of years, and then we have the Protestant Reformation, and then now we're here. Mm-hmm. That there's actually the very people who wrote the Bible, or the, or the epistles, the New Testament epistles, the letters, right, ha- then had successors, Correct. And then those successors had the successors, and then those people, right? And so we often just view Christianity as in, like, Catholic and Protestant, and that's it, right? Yeah. But talk, talk, to, talk to me, t- tell me a little bit about, like, the church history. Uh, we know that the Apostle Bart and Jude went to Armenia to plant the church, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then there was Doubting Thomas that went to India— and then they believe Mark, who uh, was close to Peter, yeah, ended up in Egypt. Egypt, right? Ethiopia, and, and they're traveling. I mean, Paul, Paul, and Peter end up in Rome. Yeah, that's pretty far away from uh, considering ancient from world, Israel. Yeah, kind yeah. of ancient world uh, demographics and geography. That's far from home. Yep. Right, and and so they're traveling on foot by ship. I mean, Paul speaks about the, the issues he has, mm-hmm. shipwrecked and all that stuff. These are th- they are risking their lives mm-hmm. to take the gospel. I mean, as far as to you know, India. Mm-hmm. You got people going into China, mm. um, and uh, disciples of disciples, not mm-hmm. necessarily direct disciples. But yeah, you got the Iranian Armenian kind of thing with Thaddeus and Bartholomew, and so the, these things um, are cross culture. I mean, these are Jews going to Indians and Egyptians and Armenians and Romans. Like, how cross cultural is that? Yeah, yeah. That, that's phenomenal, right? Yeah. It's not white supremacist racist people trying right. to oppress other people, right? Right, and and this is this is connected back to churches who that are still active today. Correct. Right. So, like the church in India can trace their lineage back to De- to Thomas. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, we grew up in the Armenian apostolic tradition, and everyone is we're the first Christian nation, right? right. And you always have Ethiopia and Armenia argue over <laughs> yeah. who's the first Christian nation, but we can trace that back all the way to Bartholomew and Jude. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it seems like uh, th- that Bartholomew and Jude or Thaddeus, um, they, they went to Armenia, and they were persecuted, heavily persecuted. Mm-hmm. And these these are guys, Bartholomew walked with Jesus. Correct. Direct the, uh, the disciples of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, eyewitnesses, mm-hmm. John says in his mm-hmm. uh, in his letter. You know, we saw him, we touched him, we, we ate with him, we heard him. Yeah. And so these guys go, take the gospel there. They're eventually martyred for their faith. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of these guys, wherever they went... It's not like they went and then became rulers and leaders and then just like oppressed everyone else. Mm -hmm. Most of them died Mm. for what they were preaching. Mm. It wasn't accepted like that. It wasn't like, whoa, look, salvation is here. People resisted this stuff. Mm -hmm. But the church was planted. There was a church, there was an underground church, you could say, in Armenia for about 300 years Mm -hmm. till Armenia officially became a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. People were meeting in caves and stuff like that. And then some of those sites are still there in Armenia. I visited some of them and... it's like really brilliant. Like, um, there's a. Uh, unfortunately, now uh, it's it's actually because of the war and the Azari situation. There's there's actually a church called Dadivank mm-hmm. in Artsakh or Nagorno Karabakh, mm-hmm. um, and uh, Dadi was a disciple, direct disciple, of Thaddeus. Wow. And like, I remember standing there talking to the priest, 
um, and uh, what, three years ago now. And I was like, okay, tell me about the history here. And he tells me, and I go, I, I was like in shock. The fact that standing there, this guy's grave is there. Mm. I was like, I'm one person essentially, right? Like one person separated. From wow. <laughs> Like that that's how close it yeah. is. And, and you kind of don't get the emotional kind of kick uh, to your guts till you're like standing in places like mm. that. And you go, man, the history is is way beyond yeah. what I can even comprehend here. Yeah. Talk about some of the other places that Christianity spread to and some of the some of the what we would call early church fathers, right? Yeah. Like they so were look, friends of the disciples or one generation removed from yeah, the Yeah, so you got the Mediterranean setting, you got North Africa being a huge center. Of Christianity, mm -hmm. um, and eventually end, ends up becoming like there's two major schools uh, with Antioch and Alexandria, Egypt. So uh, you don't really get Christianity going into Europe like that, mm -hmm. right? Northern Europe is what we mm -hmm. would consider um, till till pretty late on, till mm. till Rome essentially is like crumbling and stuff like that. Interesting. Um, you'd say whatever, third, fourth century, what yeah. would you say the Western Roman Empire? Yeah. So most of the centers of the early church, uh -huh. North Africa, Middle East, you know, Mediterranean region, you could say, you know, Greece, Rome, obviously. Yeah. Um, and then you get Constantinople, modern day Istanbul. Like it's that region. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people don't realize that the people who live in that region mm -hmm. are not Anglo-Saxons. Right, right, right. Predominantly, this is church history for a major period of uh, of our you know ancestors, yeah. and then they produce some of the best thinkers mm. that we've had. Okay. So you get Augustine of Hippo, a Hippo, right? Augustine is like everybody like quotes him. Yeah. Protestants love him, Catholics love him, like everybody yeah. loves this. Yeah. Guy. And when was Augustine around? So uh, Augustine's in the three hundreds. Okay. But Augustine's born in modern day Algeria, mm. right? It, that's. That's not in Europe. Mm -hmm. that, that's in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, you get the Cappadocian fathers, you mm -hmm. know, um, Basil, the two Gregories, uh, phenomenal church fathers. Uh, you get Athanasius, mm -hmm. who's from Alexandria. Uh, probably and Alexandria's one of the, in Egypt. Yeah. And then they have one of the early creeds or the councils. Uh, yeah, so the Athanasian councils. Creed, for example, uh -huh. right? Athan Athanasius. But yeah, you, you get councils that are taking place in, in Alexandria. So, uh, again, like one of the best written uh, uh, formulations of the Trinity um, is by Athanasius. Mm -hmm. um, stood up against Constantine when he needed to. Mm -hmm. Constantine would like waver on his theology and stuff like mm -hmm. that and would appoint like Arians mm -hmm. uh, to, to high places in office. Mm -hmm. Athanasius, I think, was exiled from the kingdom like seven times. Mm. It ended up going to Ireland mm -hmm. uh, in one of his exiles, like, mm. taking the gospel there. Like These are serious men of God who are doing serious work for the gospel mm. um, and going into extremely remote places. Again, you got to remember the context of the ancient world. Yeah, Even going to a neighboring country is not a very easy thing to do. But... You know, I've mentioned some of them, you, you know, um, like Augustine, Athanasius, Gregory, Basil, um, Antony, who's the Egyptian, who's the desert. Like, he started the monastic movement, essentially. Mm -hmm. Like that, that this is the setting. You, yep. you can't talk about this stuff without talking about these people. Do you think that deconversion, deconstruction can be a, could be one of the things that maybe we're missing from this conversation is, hey, before you deconvert or deconstruct for these reasons, right? White supremacy, Correct. bigotry, political or theopolitical gospels, as my buddy Kirk Kennedy would say. Before you deconvert for these reasons, go and examine these churches, the Egyptian Coptic Church, the Armenian Apostolic Church, mm. the Ethiopian Church, right? Go look at these that, that are not of the West, right? And look at what they believe about the very things you have issues with, the divinity of Jesus, the Trinity, um, uh, 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 a, a Christian biblical sex ethic, one man, one woman yeah. marriage, right? I mean, I can go down the list, and all of these different churches believe the the core essentials of the Christian faith, yeah, that's true. right? And so it's like, if they all believe the core essentials of the Christian faith in the same way that evangelicals believe in the core essentials of the faith, and their lineage can be directly traced back to people that walked with Jesus or one generation removed from people that walked with Jesus, isn't that then the, the could that then be the magic bullet to kind of you know, diffuse some of this, like, 
I'm looking at the Bible from a very literal Western context. Yeah, so what I would say is wh whenever you're questioning anything, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Um, it's very important for us to think, um, am I questioning essential things of Christianity mm -hmm. or am I questioning secondary things of Christianity? Mm -hmm. Cultural expressions, it, not even like secondary theological issues, mm -hmm. but let's just think about the way we do church. Mm -hmm. Most evangelicals, uh, I, <laughs> I've been in church quite a long to... to to tell you essentially how your your church service is going to run, yep. you're going to show up, welcome. <laughs> someone's going to get up there. Uh, you know, uh, there's going to be a couple of worship songs. Yep, 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 yep. After, someone's <laughs> going to get up there. They're going to give you some announcements, yep. some more worship songs, maybe some prayer. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe if you're like in a, uh, you know, in a certain setting, you might read mm -hmm. one of the creeds, mm. Chalcedonian Creed or something like that, Nicene Creed. Yep. Most aren't going to do that. And then you get a sermon, some more worship. You go home. Yeah. yeah. Right? And then if that's been your experience for like 30 years, and you kind of sit back and say, well, no, man, I, I might be more interested in like a liturgical service, mm -hmm. you know, like, and even if you know what that means, and you look at it, you go into some of these other traditions. Some of them are even Protestant traditions. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the non-Protestant traditions and stuff like that, you realize that it's done very differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You get a completely different shock to your senses when you walk into an Orthodox church. Mm -hmm. The incense is going. You're like smelling the stuff. You're mm -hmm. like, man, I'm I'm awake. There's lots of chanting. It's all men mm -hmm. in front of you, mm -hmm. like males. Mm -hmm. That's sometimes a little shocking to people who like <laughs> go to church in, in the in the Western world. Yeah, and it's like there's lots of women. Yeah. And so I would say, what is it that you're questioning? Mm. If it's a cultural expression of Christianity. There's Protestants all across the world that have different cultural expressions of their church. Mm -hmm. that you don't even have to be non-Protestant for that. It's just that's what their culture looks like. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I was looking at a mega church from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Okay, mega church. Like by mega church, do you mean like Western like, mega church or just so, the, okay, the sheer size? The size. It's okay, a mega okay. church, but it's very Western. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. It looks like a Protestant service. Mm -hmm. And then I found that it's I found that it's a Coptic church, Egyptian Coptic, church. Egyptian Coptic wow. church, and I was like, "Wow, that that was not what I would have expected from an Egyptian Coptic church because yep. it looked like an evangelical church service." Yep. So, so there's room to navigate some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're if you're kind of thinking, "Oh man, I'm a Christian," the Republican stuff is pushed too much. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, look around the world. Come on, look around the world. Is that the expression? Can you navigate that somehow? Mm -hmm. Can you be more balanced, let's just say? Yeah, that's good. Right? Um, by observing your brothers and sisters, both currently around the world mm -hmm. and then historically around the world. Can't say all of church history has been Republican. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. You can say all of church history has been conservative. Mm -hmm. I'd say probably way more conservative than the Republicans. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, way point. more conservative. Like, mm -hmm. they would shock you uh, with some of the stuff when you read some of the writings. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, man, these, these guys are serious about this stuff. Um, and so you're able to navigate that stuff without giving up the whole thing. Maybe yeah. what you need to give up is your cultural expression of Christianity. Mm -hmm. That's a uh, that's not even a secondary issue for me. That's like way down the list. Yeah, that's that's good. What do you what do you say about those Christians? And they're oh, they always tend to be like independent Baptists, generally from my experience, that are like, nope we're the only ones that got it right, <laughs> right? And because I've pressed them, like, hey, like, do you, what do you think about these other arms of the church, right? Uh, and they're like, nope, they're all corrupt churches referenced in Revelation and whatever nonsense they say. Um, what, what, how do you feel yeah, about I've that, had, I've like, had quite that, a bit of that type of, like, paradigm of the world? Like, only, not, not just Protestants, but, like, only Protestants who are of this specific arm of Protestant, which this independent Baptist thing over here, and I'm not trying to dismiss off of independent Baptists. Don't send me angry emails. Send them to <laughs> Arthur. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that paradigm? Because it's so Look, weird to uh, me. So before I, I, I can uh, go crazy here, but um, I would say I've seen it in all denominations. Okay. There's Catholics that are like this. There's mm -hmm. Orthodox like this. Yep. Like they, They're everywhere. Maybe it's a personality trait. I have mm. no idea. Okay. It could be a certain kind of person mm -hmm. who really likes very narrow understandings of things. Yep. Um, what I would say is that what you're doing is essentially chopping off your parents. Mm. Right. Like I'm talking about this historically. So for me, it's not even looking at, oh, the Catholic Church 
is like the mother or something like mm-hmm. that or whatever. The Orthodox Church is the mother. I'm the, some of that language is used and I'm co- uncomfortable with it. Yeah. Um, what I would say is when, how can you do theology without reading, say, the Cappadocian Fathers? Mm-hmm. How can you do theology without reading Augustine? Mm-hmm. Some of these guys like pride themselves by like Calvin and Calvinism, mm-hmm. right? And it's like, yeah, Augustine. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Go to Augustine yep. if you want to see Calvin's predecessor. Yep. Yep. Hundred percent. Understand what's going on there. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's essentially like willingly making yourself an orphan. Wow. <laughs> uh, and, and then saying, "I brought myself into existence. Here I yeah. am. You know, nobody else. Like my parents aren't my real parents and stuff like that. Yeah. And I just think that's really silly. Yeah. Yeah. And or proud. <laughs> I, I think it's. I think it's proud. I think. I think. Um. I was thinking about the verse in. Uh. Is it four John two sixteen. First John two sixteen, and he said, you know, these things are of the world: lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Yeah. And I was always interested about that pride of life bit because I think what's happening today is lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. We know what that is: drugs, alcohol, women, sensuality, yeah. dopamine, pleasure, food, right. easy. But there's this third category, the more subtle one, which is the pride of life. Yeah. And I think the pride of life is the need to be right, the need to, to have certainty from your paradigm. And so whenever any worldview is positioned as we are the only thing within within this other microcosm, we are we the only ones yeah. that got it right, and they have such a myoptic view that I almost am empathetic to folks who de- want to deconstruct from that. Because yeah, I'm like, yeah, like you might have if to. that's your paradigm, if Calvinism or bust... You know yeah. that I'm like, well, yeah, like that sucks. But before you before you throw the baby out with the bathwater, yeah. let's pull back and well, let's like, look like out. You see this with all sorts of stuff, right? Like I've seen it with with friends who grew up in uh, like Wesleyanism um, or grew up in like Brotherhood churches or something like mm-hmm. that, uh, and then they they like read Calvin for the first time, and mm-hmm. they're like, what? Mm-hmm. There's this whole different perspective, right. and they got really mad at their elders in their church, at their parents for not introducing them to this stuff. Mm. Reacted really bad mm-hmm. towards that. You see the opposite side. People who grew up in Reformed churches, Calvinists, that's all they hear, and they read Wesley, or they come across some Christians who aren't Wesleyan, uh, sorry, who aren't Calvinist, and then they react really, really bad. Yeah. Um, and uh, may- maybe they react so bad where it's, they give that thing entirely up, and then they go to the other extreme, mm-hmm. But then you get individuals, maybe it's not a theological issue, like I said, it's more of a cultural stuff, mm-hmm. where they're kind of raised, all they hear is, is one perspective only. Mm-hmm. They come across some other stuff, and they just give the whole thing up. Yeah. This is why I think it's very important for us to understand what are the primary things, what are the secondary things, and then what are whatever goes beyond that. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, and, and there's tons of stuff you can give up. Tons of stuff. For me, for example, lighting candles in church, Mm -hmm. not an issue. You want to light them, light them. You don't want to light them, don't light them. Mm -hmm. Okay? I personally like it. Mm -hmm. Incense in church, I like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But like my church, which is an evangelical church, when I say mine, the church I attend, Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't belong to me. Um, But the church I attend, we don't light candles. We Mm -hmm. don't have incense and stuff like that. I would prefer for us to, but that doesn't matter. That's just me. Sure. Um... Now, if I were to, say, find some kind of a mixture of, like, nice evangelical theology, mm-hmm. evangelical church that has some of these cultural components mm-hmm. and stuff like that, like, I'd appreciate that. I actually know an Armenian church that does this. Mm-hmm. Like, during a Protestant service, yeah. people will walk up, go light candles, and leave or stay in service, mm. which is a shock to, like, Protestants don't operate like that. Mm. But you see it in the apostolic sense. Yep. So... Um, yeah, I mean, give up the stuff that you can give up. Yeah. But don't give up the essential stuff because you ha- you're angry at you know these cultural expressions. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And I think the anger at the cultural expressions or the anger at the certainty can set people up to go from one extreme to the other. Yeah, so I can blame church leaders for this. Okay. Um, I I consider myself a leader in the church. I'm an elder in my church. And so I take fo- first responsibility. And the Bible says that you know judgment or discipline starts in the in the household of God. Mm-hmm. So I think we ought to take discipline. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, we ought to take responsibility for this. Yep. In this sense, that if we conflate and make secondary issues primary issues, mm-hmm. that's going to become a problem for people. Mm. Let's not do that. That's good. Look, if you've made, I know some people might get angry at this. Some people have made 
let's just say, young earth creationism. <laughs> right. You go straight I there. Got, dude, I, got, I, have, look, I love you guys. Uh, I have friends uh th that are at my uh, church yeah yeah really good friends with we go out we have these conversations yeah. um and and but we discussed like this is not a primary issue bro yeah like you i get what you're saying yeah. do you also I, have friends that are theistic evolutionists i when you say friends i mean i have acquaintances that acquaintances, are acquaintances yeah, yeah yeah i, I distinguish between friends yeah. and acquaintances i have acquaintances that are theistic yeah. evolutionists. and you would you would say the same thing to them yeah don't mm -hmm. make it a primary issue yeah. This is something you could be wrong on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like my end times theology. Like, yeah. I lean post millennial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I say I lean there, but it's we like don't every, know. I, yeah. Well, everything that comes out of my mouth sounds post millennial, but yeah. I still say I lean there because yeah. I want to give room that I could be wrong. Yep. If I make, if we don't want to go after the young earth creationists, if I make premillennialism an essential part of my Christian walk, mm -hmm. and somebody goes, no, I really don't see that. I don't think uh, I have to support Israel like gung ho, like yeah. a lot of evangelical churches. Yeah. Um, and then you get like all these issues that comes mm -hmm. to the surface. It's like, it's okay. They're, they're, you can have differences of opinion on this stuff. Right. It is not an essential issue. Right. Right. You can give that up. You can hold a different view. Yep. Right or wrong. I'm not, I'm not discussing whether it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to discuss whether young earth creationism or old, old earth or theistic evolutionism is, is correct. Mm -hmm. what I'm saying is, there are Christians, mm -hmm. legitimate, God-loving, Bible-fearing Christians that hold these positions. They all can't be right. Yeah. Someone's wrong there. Someone's wrong. Okay? Someone's so wrong. So you got to have grace there. Yeah. And again, I, I go back and I do this all the time. And I think we, uh, when we uh, had a conversation, one of the interviews, um, you know, Augustine says, uh, in, in the essentials, unity, non-essentials, yeah. liberty, in all things, charity. Yeah, yeah. Like, I want to give liberty. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's it. But I think what I've realized in ministry, this is just practical ministry mm -hmm. experience, um, when you're not making that stuff as the most important things, or I would say as gospel, mm -hmm. then people can change their minds. They can deconstruct from views mm. without giving up Christianity. It's good. Like, oh man, I changed my mind. You know, whatever. Five years ago, I was Wesleyan and now I'm a Calvinist. Mm -hmm. Or I was a Calvinist and I'm less of a Calvinist. Like mm -hmm. we got guys that, like this at our church. Yep. Yep. And they didn't give up a bunch of stuff. Yeah. yeah. They just shifted some interpretation stuff in the Bible, but they're still following Jesus, loving Jesus, and being in the church and serving the yeah. church. Yeah, and I, I think when people have that certainty about young earth creationism, about, I don't know, the end times view, yeah. about Calvinism, and then someone pulls on that thread, then the entire thing collapses because you've now conflated your Calvinism with Christianity. Uh -huh. yes. And Calvinism can be a great utility for some people, right? It, it could... It could give you a philosophical view. It could give you a, a logic-based approach, reasoning. But when that gets conflated with Christianity, then I understand why you pull on that thread and the whole thing collapses. Yeah, yeah. so it becomes so central to, to, to your worldview. Well, your identity. And yeah, it shouldn't be that central. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Now, real quick, give us a breakdown of what I would call the four arms of the church because a lot of people don't know this. And I get a lot of these questions like, can you give me just a great book? And I'm like, I'm just going to create a resource for people, <laughs> right? Uh, master course in uh, church history. The big four arms of the church, when did they split? And like, how are they exhibiting today? Okay, so, I mean, three plus one, uh, or you can say four. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you get Catholic, uh, it seems like a lot of people are aware of it. And then Protestants, a lot of people are aware of it. Right. Um, what a lot of people aren't aware of is Eastern Orthodoxy, mm -hmm. which sometimes is called the Greek Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I call it Eastern Orthodoxy because calling it Greek Orthodox, I think, does a disservice to the Russian Orthodox Church mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and the influence of the Russian Orthodox Church. As, as of very recently, the Ukrainian Orthodox right, Church yeah. was in there. Now they're not. Yeah. Um, and that's pre-war, by the way. That split happened. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, so th you get the three major branches, and, and then you get what's called Oriental Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. the or and Oriental Orth uh, Orthodox churches um, are actually probably culturally more broad. I mean, Catholics are pretty broad, mm -hmm. um, but you get, there's smaller pockets of people groups. So Armenians, some of the Indian church, um, some Assyrians, and then Egyptians, Ethiopians. Mm -hmm. Like, so it's it's very interesting, right? It's and they were the first ones that split. Um, so you've always had an east and west dichotomy. Yep. But it's been more of a way of thinking mm -hmm. than a split. Sure. Um, the the first 
school, you could say, way of thinking, but like when they were training people, yeah. is in Alexandria. It's the Alexandrian school. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and then you get the, the, the second one is the Antiochian school. It's in Antioch. Mm -hmm. These are and, and you get West and East. Because Alexandria is in Egypt. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So you get these two schools there. Uh, there's always been an emphasis on one or the, or you know some things. These guys like a certain language uh, expression of it better. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of this stuff has to do with language, Latin, Greek, mm -hmm. you know, some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, and so, but you get uh, in 451, you get the Oriental Orthodox Church splitting um, because, well, at least the Armenians aren't at uh, Chalcedon. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they also don't like the way that they try to philosophically break some of this stuff down. Mm -hmm. um, and then in uh, in like the 11th century, you get a breaking of East and West, mm -hmm. like clear-cut breaking. But again, there's always issue over like icons and stuff sure, like that. Sure, sure. Right? Should we use statues? Should we use 3D images, 2D images? Yeah. Like which one? Yeah. The, are we really violating one of the commandments yeah. by creating statues? Yeah. So these conversations. They were having these conversations back oh, then. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're seriously thinking about this stuff. So you get this east west kind of break. And then obviously you get in uh, in the 1500s, you get the split from the Catholic Church for the Protestants. But that, again, that that's just from the Catholics. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've always had different expressions. Like you have Eastern Catholics who do service, who do church service. This is what I mean, like cultural expressions. Mm -hmm. You get Catholics that you walk into the church service, mm -hmm. you would think you're in an Eastern Orthodox church mm -hmm. because it's Greek Catholic. Mm -hmm. So it looks different. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. They might not have all, all the statues and mm -hmm. all that stuff that maybe people in America, especially if they're like from Hispanic backgrounds and stuff like that, are, are used to seeing mm -hmm. in churches, lots mm -hmm. of statues. Yeah, lots yeah. Of, um, so you get a lot of icons yep. uh, being used. So yeah, you've, you've had these splits that have happened. Uh, but even in the midst of these splits, um, churches have kept the primary fundamental doctrines. Yeah. What do you think about people who say, um, you know, hey, you guys are creating this whole like kumbaya scenario on this podcast. Everyone oh. is Christian. Everyone loves Jesus. But man, we got some disagreements within our, the Armenian apostolic right, on yeah. the christening. We talked about that yeah. on our last interview. We have disagreements with, with the Catholic Church, right? How they define yeah. grace and first salvation versus second salvation. And I like a lot of these guys. I listen to like Council of Trent. I listen to mm -hmm. Pints with Aquinas. Uh, a lot of these guys are really brilliant Catholic apologists. Um, but we have some disagreements with them, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a reason I'm not Catholic. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, like uh, there's a reason I'm not Eastern Orthodox. Right. Like I have Eastern Orthodox friends. Yeah. Um, and uh, and there's a reason why I'm not Armenian apostolic. That would be like the closest thing, right? Like the yeah. immediate thing yep. for me to be like, okay, I'm going to be. And and they're theological. They're serious reasons. Yep. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is kind of having a broader understanding of the history of our family. Yep. Look, I don't need to agree with my dad on everything to recognize the fact that he's my dad. Yeah. That this is my family. Yep. I don't need to agree uh, with everything with my brothers. Yeah. To to say this is my family, here's where the origins are. Here's stuff we agree on. Yep. Non, you know, we don't question this stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I I got issues with Catholics. I got issues with Armenian Apostolic, Eastern Orthodox. Yeah. And they have issues with me. There's no issue. They, they, like that's cool. Yeah. I'm cool with that. Yeah. Um, and some of it's really really serious stuff. Yeah. I'm not saying let's all agree. Like, if somebody asked me, should I go become Eastern Orthodox or Catholic or yeah. something like that, I'd be very hesitant to say yes. Yeah, yeah. Right? Be because of those issues. Yeah. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're good. talking about is people saying, I'm just going to give up Christianity because of what's happened in yeah. America in the last yeah. 10 years. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like, that's not a good enough reason when you consider 2,000 years of history. Yeah, yeah. That's good. And is it is it fair to say that some of these other arms have kind of reconciled like aren't like orthodox and orientals kind of like ah it was kind of a big misunderstanding <laughs> we got some stuff yeah you know, <laughs> language barriers like they, they're cool now and aren't tried. catholics kind of kind of cool with some of these other camps now so, yeah if you if you go into like church canon kind of law and stuff like that yeah. uh, like there's like what's called like in communion mm -hmm. um where if needed, some of it's worded a bit differently, but if needed, you can take, go take communion in the Catholic Church or something like that if you don't have an Orthodox wow. Church to go to. Um, uh, I mean, with the Protestants, it's still like uh, a bit shaky. I mean, yeah. because the, the break there is probably uh, a lot more 
recent. Yeah. And more probably, recent and, more and, recent and, and very bloody. More, yeah, very, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, definitely. Well, l let me ask you this. Didn't a lot of the kind of problematic parts about what we would call problematic parts about Catholicism, the papacy, is that, did I say that right? Papacy. Yeah. Papacy. Yeah. Um, wasn't that added later? Like like Vatican I, Vatican II was kind of after Luther and the Protestant Reformation, where yes. they started saying stuff like, we're the only church and, you know, that that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, um, man. You have to accept the Pope, you know, like we would be the Pope, right? And I think we would all look and say, well, there was multiple church fathers, just like we started this conversation. Right. And there was multiple guys that went out and planted and had disciples, and they would kind of align it all to Peter and the Pope it, and it say, seems like our the, way or the, the highway the, with that. With it seems that? like the papacy is established for sure with Gregory the Great. Okay. You know, it's like 6th century, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong there on my dating, so... okay. Uh, forgive me. Still hundreds of years after Peter. <laughs> correct, correct. But I mean, look, be, because of this whole concept of uh, one of the things I disagree with all these churches, by the way, is is what's called the apostolic succession. Okay. Uh, that because uh, I think they internally disagree with each other. That's mm -hmm. part of the reason why I disagree yeah. with it. Um, that we've had it this way. This is directly from the apostle, so yes. therefore we have it the right way. But it's like, well, you guys all disagree with each other, so there, there's an issue there. Someone's someone's not right on this. Yeah. But. Um, that doesn't mean they don't have a direct connection. It just means the conclusions they're coming to based on the direct yeah. connections, yeah. right? Uh, so, but they'll take it back to Peter. It's not like it, it, it doesn't matter for them to say for you to say, well, no, like it's a hundred years, uh, hundreds of years later when it comes to Catholicism or even Armenian Orthodoxy and stuff like that. It, it doesn't matter because it's still going to go back there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, so I want to be gracious in that kind of a, uh, a conversation. Sure. Um, but some things, yeah, they get developed. Throughout history, um, certain statements become more solidified mm -hmm. uh, because now you get a pushback. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's like, oh, we hadn't really thought about coming down very hard on this issue, but now we got this other group calling us out on it, mm -hmm. so we're going to take a stance. Some of that's definitely happened. Mm -hmm. um, and there's internal justifications to these things. Yeah. Right or wrong, there's internal justifications. Yeah. Um, I think... One of the things that is disingenuous about some Protestant circles is this idea of like, well, we just take the Bible for what it says. We just read the Bible, bro, and whatever it says is what it says, <laughs> yeah. right? And it's kind of built on the sola scriptura of the solas. Misunderstanding of the sola scriptura. A, a misunderstanding right. of the sola yeah. scriptura. And I've always heard it said, and, and again, maybe I, I'm just, I have a unique perspective on this, but I've always heard it said like, scripture's final authority, but it's not only authority that yeah. we, we gleam from church history, we gleam from other thinkers. You broke something down for me that I found extremely helpful, and I've went back to it multiple times, the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Correct. Could you kind of explain? Because I think we all do this, but I feel like the Wesleyans have kind of created like a little roadmap for it. But I feel like every camp looks at these four things when we're trying to figure out what it, what do the we scriptures to, say yeah. on something. Re Can you reason, break that down? Reason dictates it. Yeah. So uh, you get reason, experience, tradition, and then scripture. Yeah. Right. Uh, you can invert this and and go back, you know, top down or from the bottom up in regards to what what you're looking at. But it. Sometimes you put it in a, in a little square and yeah. it's four parts. Essentially, you got to use all these things if, if you're going to come up with any kind of a perspective, yeah. ethics, um, morality you're going to dictate or something like that. It's got to fit these categories. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be experientially sound. Yep. Right. Or your experiences, if you want to say, have to be reasonable yeah. in accordance to scripture mm -hmm. and tradition. Yeah. Or your traditions need to go along with scripture reason, yeah. experience, right? Yeah. Like you can ask this question. Yep. If you have a, for example, if, if I, was, uh, I mentioned this the other day in, in my uh, conversation Q&A as well, but like there's this uh, idea among some people that God has a physical body, mm -hmm. like the Father. Mm -hmm. It's like because of what they read in Genesis, let us make men in our image and our likeness. Um, and I was having a conversation with a buddy of mine and we're looking at it. I'm like, okay, the first thing that should probably make you stop and think mm -hmm. is... Very, very, very few people throughout church tradition have interpreted the yeah. passage this way. That's good. Really, really brilliant people who know the original languages were better, who are closer to the cultural context, yep. Yep. they just didn't take it like this. Yep. So not that you're wrong because of that, mm -hmm. but at least it's it's a place of humility to say, okay, right? Um, and then like, are you looking at scripture properly within its context, within yes. its language? And so you ask these questions yeah. and you go, well, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. 
this is what I mean. It's like when people come at it and say, oh, I read the Bible and that's it. I'm really good at it. Mm-hmm. I just kind of look at it and say, yeah, that's not enough. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think one of the things I, I instantly comes to me when, with that example, and I've seen this, is uh, sexuality, hmm. right? And so you think God, uh, you either worship God or God or sex becomes your God in most, most societies. I think our society yeah. is kind of becoming yeah, that, true. right? And so uh, without talking about, you know, without having to go into like same sex marriage or any of that kind of stuff, but like say something like, um, God told me it was okay for me and my girlfriend to sleep together before marriage. Yeah. God told me this, and I and I don't know if you've ever heard this. I've, I've heard this stuff in church. People say right? God told me to divorce my spouse. God, yeah, yeah, yeah. God told me to do this. God told me that. And so we go, okay. So, so that's your experience, quote unquote. Correct. Right now, when we talk about the the quadrilateral, we have to funnel that through. Okay, well, what does the scripture say? Correct. Okay, if we're talking about God's intent for sexuality, what does scripture say? Uh, scriptures are pretty clear. Sexual immorality, pornonia, right? Um, covenantal marriage pretty clear on that okay so say you twist and finagle those scriptures yeah. right and i've heard you've heard this with 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 the same-sex attraction uh same-sex relationship thing oh well no that was only uh, uh boys and pedoph- Correct. pedophilia Correct. that's not really about yeah fill in the blank that's really about blah 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 blah, blah. And it's like you read romans one and you go ah, sounds like it's yeah, pretty clear usually that context when that conversation comes up is the corinthians passage and, yeah. and they could be right on it yeah right? i don't necessarily have issues with them being yeah right but on. then you read romans one exactly. and it's describing yeah. the perversion of the intent for sexuality right, right? and you go okay well, okay romans was pretty clear but the other two reason correct we would point to natural law St. Thomas Aquinas, yes. right? And then church history. Has anyone held this position ever before in church history? Here's the, here's where it's funny to me that the individuals who usually argue for this are at the same time. I'm generalizing here, yeah. right? But at the same time, they're against like oppressive, white, male, whatever, yeah. heterosexual kind of fill in the blank. Sure. Um, and then what they're, but what they're saying is, 2,000 years of history, you guys have all been ignorant because how you guys have been stuck into your cultural framework. Right. We're the enlightened ones. Right, right. We'll tell you how this stuff is. Yep. Pride of life, though. We got the answers. Yeah. All of church history is wrong. All of natural law is wrong. We got to figure yeah, it, it out. It's, it's very interesting to me that the individuals who hold these views are now, in some of these traditions, getting into conflict with their non-Western counterparts. Yep. So within um, within the Anglican Church, for mm-hmm. example, you get like the African Anglicans mm-hmm. who are very conservative, like clashing with Western American and British Anglicans who tend to be more liberal. Wow. And it's like, what are you going to do? Tell them they need to sit down and listen to your interpretation. Right. <laughs> How oppressive is that? Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's a good point. Right? Like yeah. you guys don't know any better. You guys yeah. are stuck in your ancient ways. You yeah. know, it's like yeah. maybe you're wrong. Yeah. Just maybe yeah. you're wrong. Yeah. Right. Um, and and look, maybe there's a more nuanced and balanced approach we can have this stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's take responsibility. If we've mistreated gay people, mm-hmm. if mis- if we've mistreated people who struggle who suffer, I would say, mm-hmm. right, um, with various kinds of temptations. Mm-hmm. We've kind of shunned them and, and called them all sorts of names. Dude, that's a point of confession. Yeah. That's a point of saying, we're sorry. Yep. Like, forgive us. Yep. Um, uh, the truth, we're not, uh, when you say that, you're not giving up the truth of what you're saying. Mm-hmm. It's just the way you've communicated yeah. that truth. And just confess it, admit your fault, and say, how can we how can we deal with this? Yeah. If that's what you're saying, yeah. man, let's sit down and pray together. Let's sit down and confess together. Yeah. Like I, I don't have any issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or, or even saying, uh, someone being same sex attractive, attracted and wrestling with that is the same as someone who's living that lifestyle. Correct. They're conflating yeah, the two, two different things. Two different things. Somebody could be same sex attracted and trying to process it, work through it, look at church history, look at natural law, look at yeah. scripture, trying to figure out versus someone who is, well, no, I've just made up my mind and this is how I'm going to live my life and 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 basically screw everything yeah. you're talking about. I've got the answers I got. Or I, I think worst of all is when you uh when somebody changes what scripture says into mm. uh, into what they want. Yeah. Uh, to be said. Yeah. And and this happens not only on the sexual front, but yeah. look, it happens, I would say, uh, being a conservative, right? Like socially, politically a conservative. Mm-hmm. Uh, this happens on the political uh, side uh, of uh, conservatism where when it comes to like social issues, mm-hmm. 
right? Like I, I think the Bible in the Old Testament sets up a pretty well-rounded safety net for immigrants, mm-hmm. uh, what it calls the aliens in the land, mm-hmm. for people who have gone into poverty for various reasons. Mm-hmm. There's a safety net there. Yep. God specifically says it. So there's room for us to, de- to develop governmental policies yeah. that creates a safety net yeah. for those who are struggling and suffering. Dude, that's w- not to veer into politics. That's one of the reasons why I'm not a registered Republican. Yeah. Not a registered. And I don't like that. The, like I would say I'm theologically conservative and socially conservative in a lot of ways. But I think the DACA stuff of Trump, like I was extremely yeah. disappointed because I'm like, dude, you, you could have been a unifier. And instead, these folks that have been here since they were children. Yeah, yeah. And like, this is all they know. And you're like, ah, send him back to Guatemala. Like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I forget who it was. It might have been Ted Cruz, uh, but I could be wrong here. But someone was suggesting that we limit immigration um, and then put these people on a path to citizenship. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I thought that was probably the best compromise. Yeah. Whatever. If, if you accept a million immigrants every year, mm-hmm. take that down to 500,000 mm-hmm. and just... Make these people citizens. Yeah, the people that are already here. Five hundred thousand yeah. a year. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And tell them, hey, in the next 10, 20 years, or whatever, I probably won't take that long. But here's what you're gonna yep. be at. Yep. Like, I think that's reasonable. That's yep. a pretty nice compromise. Yeah. Like, yeah. and and I know some people were suggesting it, but never really um, took off. And again, politics is is a funny game, and and I never really like jump in, like they're they're my brothers or something like that. Have you like, have you looked at the internal fighting of? Matt Walsh and Maj Taylor Green, the uh, Black Guns Matter. Have you no, seen any of that? So, no. so long story short, um, he's a black conservative. I think I've seen his videos. And he, yeah, I mean, yeah I pretty, 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 and 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 Matt Walsh did this whole like, well, you know, slavery existed everywhere, and slavery is not unique to America, and da, 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 da. and he's like, dude, like you're undermining how bad chattel slavery was, and this is not how you win black people and brown people over to become registered Republicans. Correct. Like you don't, you don't undermine like the actual history of how different it was here. Yeah. And, and then the ramifications of it in, in the sense of, you know, uh, Jim Crow and all the, all the, the, all the blowback of it. And it was a big splat, you know, Matt Walsh kind of dug his heels in and I'm just like, it's unnecessary. Why? Like, what is the, like, why can't you just acknowledge that? Like, dude, what happened in America to black people is different than what happened in other parts of the world with regards to how they did slavery or how slavery was in, a, in biblical times. It was different. Yeah. It just is what it is. Why do you need to dig your heels in and be like, no, all people have been enslaved. Like, what are, yeah, what are even you trying to get so, across? Even so, all people have been enslaved. Like, most people around the world yeah. have been slavery. That doesn't mean it's been okay. Right. That doesn't mean it's been right. okay. So, um, I'm reading, I, I'm listening. I pulled up my phone because yeah. I'm listening to a book. Douglas Grutheis, mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Douglas Grutheis. Yeah apologist philosopher brilliant individual Mm -hmm. uh just wrote a book i've been listening to it i'm like halfway done with it. it's called fire in the streets Mm -hmm. um and he he, he's essentially fire Fire in the streets talking about the riots and stuff blm movement Mm -hmm. and all that stuff and like when he deals with slavery Mm -hmm. he's like it's bad we need to repent from it it's it's a stench on our history moving on let's talk about these other issues right like he does he doesn't try to justify even though like I, i think in one of the portions he said yeah slavery's been around everywhere yeah but what does that mean? Like, what do you conclude from that? That yeah. it's okay? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's kind of like saying wife beating has been around <laughs> in all cultures <laughs> everywhere. Like, yeah. And then this guy's like beating his wife. Yeah. It's like, and then what? What's yeah. the conclusion? Help Matt, help me here yeah. with the conclusion. I think what's unique here is that folks were brought over from a different continent, placed in a different part of the world, robbed of their culture, and then just kind of told to get over it. Yeah, no, you know, and I'm like, ah, that's you know, like, and 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 seldom, like, I feel like recently have we gotten around to to conservatives being like, yeah, like policies from the from 100 years ago impact people today. Yeah, that's you know what I mean. Like, like I just started hearing like the Ben Shapiro say that, you know, and now how much so ultra conservative abolitionists Uh were like, burn down the system. Yeah, it's really bad. Yeah, I'm talking like. Before the Civil War, yep, yep. they're like the Constitution, the Declaration of right, Independence, right. It's all pro-slavery, burn it down. Yeah, I mean, th- th- this was not a large group, but yeah. some of these people existed, and yeah. they're like very conservative Christians, yep. um, who are saying we can't tolerate any of this stuff. It all needs to go. Burn down the Constitution. Yeah. Whoa, they, they were like against the system. They were, Whoa, they thought the American system. Now, again, not a very large group. A lot of a lot of people were more sensible, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. They wanted to compromise and stuff like that, and I think compromise essentially ended up 
winning out amongst the abolitionists. Mm -hmm. Because some uh, some abolitionists were like unwilling for any any kind of a uh, thing, mm -hmm. um, concession or some, something like that. But again, it, it you stating facts doesn't do anything. Yep. For you to say, yeah, people have suffered and struggled all throughout history. Mm -hmm. And then what? Like yeah, we shouldn't yeah. help. <laughs> right, like, right. They're, they're, you can't get an ought from an is. Yeah. Like that. That's a yeah. fallacy. Yeah, it's a logical fallacy. You're just stating a fact. Like, okay, and then what? Yeah. Do we help them? Do we not? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh well, if you have the ability to help them, help them. It's yeah. like okay, cool. So it doesn't matter if it's happened or ha hasn't happened. Yeah. If like nobody was impoverished yeah. all throughout history, like yeah. everybody was like really wealthy and yeah. stuff, and your neighbor fell into poverty. Like, what are you gonna say? Yeah. Nobody's been in this situation forever. It's like, yeah. no, help them. Right. It's, it's like yeah. simple. Simple. So some of this, we talk past each other. Mm -hmm. Um, we do it, man. We do lots of stuff yeah. for like clicks and yeah, you know, hundred percent and all that stuff. So, so tell me about the apologetics course that you have coming up because I think this is going to be a, a practical utility. One, just I think people can gleam a lot from the way you think about these sorts of conversations. I right. think you think about it from a very Christ-centered, reasonable, godly point of view. And and then the your your felt like the felt need you have for why this is important today in the context of apologetics yeah. being necessary. So I have a pretty wide definition of apologetics. I'll okay. put it that way. Apologetics for me has to do with the Christian worldview, not okay. just giving answers. Okay. Okay. J.P. Moreland has a really good way of putting this, where he says uh, the the purpose of apologetics is is the is to train the believer in whatever it is that they believe, why and what they believe. Right. And then give answers to objections that unbelievers have. Mm -hmm. That's, but I, I look at it in, in a more worldview kind of sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so apologetics for me will help you answer questions about sexuality and race mm. and all that. Yeah. So the way I've designed this course is that it is not just an apologetics course; it's an introduction to apologetics and philosophy. Oh, that's good. So what I'm going to run the students through is a historical development until until the Middle Ages of philosophical thought. Mm -hmm. Pre-Socratic, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and then some of the guys that come after them. Um, and then parallel uh, in a parallel fashion, speak about how Christians answer the major questions of life. Why should we be good? Mm. This is a question the ancient philosophers were asking. Mm -hmm. So it's a 10-session course, mm -hmm. two hours per session. Mm -hmm five weeks so twice a week um it's a live course but if people like i have people signed up right now who aren't going to be able to make it to mm -hmm. the times we have mm -hmm. um and uh, we're going to send them the recordings i'll be available for people to email me yeah. and, and all that stuff and again the idea is to help form our worldview yeah because i don't think it's enough for you to say you're a christian like i believe in jesus and i'm saved and i'm going to go to heaven yeah because you could, that could be all true and well of you, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. you not have a well-formed worldview. Yeah. So when you come across questions of politics mm -hmm. and ethics yeah. and social justice, mm -hmm. you, you have no place, you, you don't have anywhere in your worldview to place those things and be able to give a reasonable response, yeah. a solid Christian answer yeah. that is scripturally informed, that is historically and theologically informed. So that that's the idea of, of offering this course. And real quick, just give people your credentials and where because you're way way smarter than I am and super educated. I don't know about that. <laughs> Edu education has nothing to do with being smart, but um, <laughs> you can be very educated and very stupid. But, <laughs> that's true. Um, I uh, look. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in biblical studies from Life Pacific University with a minor in education. Okay. So I've always wanted to teach, man. Nice. Teaching is my gift. So um, that's that's there. And then I have a master's degree in philosophy. From Talbot School of Theology. Yeah, two masters. No, no, one master. I have a bachelor's okay. with a minor in education. Got it. Okay. And then a master's. And then a master's in philosophy. Dude, that's so dope. And where can they so, find you at? Uh, my website, apologiacenter.com, YouTube uh, channel, Apologia Center, um, and um, Instagram, Apologia Center. Apologia Center. <laughs> Amazing. And we'll link all that up in the description of this, guys. Go subscribe to his channel and check out this course. I think this is going to be incredible. Any final thoughts before we get out of here? Oh, man, I want to thank you for this. Um, I'm, I'm the first guest. Is You're that, the first okay. in-person guest. Uh, the studio is not even <laughs> done. You're the first one. It's really awesome that it's. It happens to be an Armenian person. Yes. Yeah. It is. Uh, it is. That's, have, all, that's on purpose. <laughs> we 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 support our own here. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, God's gracious, man. Uh, thank you for the work that you're doing. Look, guys. Uh, my final thought would be, 
if we're gonna take a position, yeah, let's not be ignorant of the position we're taking. Yeah, let's be well thought out. Let's be gracious in our approach. Let's yeah. love people. Uh, the you know the the apologetics passage that everyone quotes tells us to do these things with gentleness and respect. Come on. So let's respect people. Let's respect people's worldview, even if we think the worldview is wrong. Yep. Show them respect, right? And and just be generous with people. And I think we will discover that our conversations are a lot more fruitful and we're probably building a lot better friendships than just being always in conflict, always divisive, in the church divisive, in politics mm -hmm. divisive, in our families divisive. Just like there's a bunch of stuff we can unite over. Um, and those are all like essentials that we can agree on and unite over and then have really fun discussions over secondary issues. That's good. That's it. And they said that Simeon blessed God. God.